When you say the name Raven Software, most people are probably going to think of the Call of Duty games, and I mean, that's fair enough. It's really all those guys have been working on for the last decade or so. But the true Chad gamers are also going to remember that these are the guys who've worked on some of the best first-person shooters ever made. Heretic in Hexen, Star Trek Elite Force, Quake 4, yeah, Quake 4, you heard me. And of course, Soldier of Fortune. One of the most notorious shooters for its time due to its graphic content. Yeah, so-called graphic content that by today's standards, it's kind of like watching a couple of puppies play fighting. I did a video on this game seven odd years ago, back at a point when I've literally only got a couple of hundred or so views per video, and at a time when I had no idea I'd still be doing this seven years later. I think the quality and length of that video reflected that mindset. So seeing it's been 20 years now since this thing came out, I thought it'd be fun to go back and do another video on it. Maybe going into a bit more detail into some of the things I overlooked. Also, just because it's an awesome game that everyone should be aware of and play. It's one of those games that you can't really call yourself a true FPS fan until you've played and finished. Along with Corridor 7 and Gal Gun 2. Am I being sarcastic? You decide. Up online, let's get started. It's really hard to explain how good the late 90s and early 2000s were for gaming, especially being into first person shooters. And unless we ever have some kind of first person shooter renaissance, I think it's going to be safe to say that it was the period when some of the best games for the genre were ever released. Soldier of Fortune, I think, is one of those games. And it's just so different to anything else Raven Software had ever done before. It came out way back in early 2000, and the way that I came to know about it was when a mate of mine got it for his birthday. I can even still remember playing through that opening level and being gobsmacked by the gameplay and the graphics, which at the time I thought looked pretty incredible. It's kind of funny looking at it now and considering that when this thing came out, it was heavily scrutinized in Australia because of its graphic violence, which like I said, is kind of funny by today's standards considering how tame it is. I don't think it's that much gorier or violent than any other games around the same time period, like Duke Nukem 3D, Blood, or Quake for that matter. And there's no swear words either, which I think is way worse for a kid to see in a video game than violence. I mean, a kid playing a video game all day isn't going to go out and start shooting people in real life, but a kid hearing profanity is probably more likely to start swearing. At least, I know I did when I played a game like Kingpin, for instance. I'm prepared to scour the earth for this motherfucker. Anyway, praise for this graphically violent glory has to go to Raven Software's Ghoul Engine, which was a new system they'd implemented that gave character models 26 separate zones they could take damage from. It's kind of similar to how the damage worked in Quake 2. I mean, you might have noticed if you ever played that game, how enemies would change the more damage they took. Well, this is now the same concept, but just dialed up to 11. And it's a really early example of the kind of damage modeling that we really now take for granted in shooters. I mean, for instance, shoot someone in the head and it leaves an exit wound if not just a bloody stump. Or shoot them in the legs and chest and you get a nice looking exit wound too. Now look, I know it sounds like I just explained every single shooting game in existence, but back then this stuff was pretty new. It all carried across to the animations as well, like shoot someone in the leg for instance and you'd see them hopping around in pain. Shoot them in the hand and they'd shake their hand in agony. What I also used to think was a pretty cool touch was how enemies would keep spasming from being shot even after they were dead as long as you kept firing. The only other game of the time I can think of that matched this was Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64, and really that's a bit of a testimony to Perfect Dark, that a console game was somehow being able to match what was pulled off on the PC. At the end of each level, you'd even get this little stat screen that showed you the types of kills you were getting. It was amazing stuff for the time. You could actually potentially play this game without killing everyone too, because if you shoot someone in the hand and cause them to drop their weapon, then they just cower on the ground defenseless. But that'd be kind of pointless, I mean, it would be like going to a strip club and then just sitting there and reading a magazine. Not that I'd know anything about strip clubs. Soldier Fortune runs on the Quake 2 engine, and there's just always going to be something about the way this engine looks that hits me right on that sweet nostalgia spot. Modeling for character models is blocky and basic, but it still has a lot of charm to it. The weapons are all modeled really well, and the environments look great too, with a fair bit of variety. Even though this is little more than just a run and gun corridor shooter, a genre that's all but extinct nowadays, I think the level design does a good job of keeping things interesting by making sure it just doesn't feel like you're moving through the same looking areas over and over. I really like the music in this game too. It changes the mood for every single level you're in, and it's a good early example of an adaptive soundtrack. Again, something that's become the norm for gaming in general. 
When you're just walking through a level minding your own business, the music is gonna reflect that. Like it's gonna reflect what happens when three guys come around the corner and you put them out to pasture with your shotgun. Now like I said, when this thing came out in Australia, I remember it being talked about a fair bit. I mean, Soldier of Fortune was basically a military shooter if you really break it down, but compared to other games at the time like the Delta Force and the Rainbow Six series, it was a lot more graphic. I still remember one of the earliest screenshots I ever saw for this game was that image of an enemy having their goddamn head blown off by a sniper rifle, leaving behind a blood decal that looked like something that Tom Savini pulled off in Dawn of the Dead. I think a big reason it garnered a lot of the attention was the subject matter itself. Soldier of Fortune wasn't about killing aliens or demons, I mean this stuff involved actual people. And you don't need to look further than that intro cinematic in the subway to see what I'm talking about. Where you see that poor civilian getting their goddamn head blown off, and this is like two minutes into the game. In fact, it wasn't uncommon in some of the missions to see civilians getting gunned down all the time by the enemies. This was also reflected a bit in its story too, which is kind of like something that could be taken out of a Tom Clancy novel. You're playing as legendary soldier of fortune John Mullins, a mercenary working for The Shop, which is a secret anti-terrorism organization employed by the UN. John works alongside his buddy Hawk, chasing down a neo-Nazi group that's stolen four nuclear weapons. Enjoy the trip? It was long. It's a violent journey that's going to take you from New York City to Siberia, Iraq and Japan, among a heap of others. Initially your goal is just to recover the nukes, but after you bugger that one up, you're then just trying to find them and disarm them. After this is accomplished, your objective then changes to tracking down the people who sold the nukes in the first place and trying to figure out their motives. This brings you into contact with a group called The Order, led by a dude named Sergei Decker, who kind of sounds like Hans Gruber from Die Hard, and then looks a bit like the cyborg ninja from Metal Gear Solid. Bring me another. Along the way, you're going to be racking up a serious body count, the kind of thing you'd expect in a Paul Verhoeven film. For pretty much every mission, you're just going from room to room and cleaning house. Mullins doesn't discriminate here either. Men and women of all ages and races are all brutally gunned down here in the name of world peace. Killing half a dozen guys in each area before then heading on to the next one forms the central gameplay loop, and kind of little else to the point that at times it can become a bit monotonous. Thankfully though the weapons do their best to stave that off as much as possible. Soldier of Fortune's weapons really are a vintage example of gun porn at its absolute finest, and about the only thing that I don't like here is that you've got a weapon limit, which kind of downplays the mayhem, but still the shooting in this thing really holds up. For starters, all of these weapons are modelled really well, and especially for the time, and they've got great animations. Aside from often having alternate fire modes, each weapon even has two unique handling animations. The shotgun, for instance, has one where John throws it up and flips it in the air. For the pistols, you can choose whether or not John holds it in his right or left hand. It kind of shows that Raven Software really know their key demographic. Instead of going for a realistic, tactical approach to the shooting, they've gone for more of an action movie kind of feeling. You don't have to worry about recoil or accuracy all that much either, though that is something they'd integrate for the sequel. I guess because they didn't have the licensing or the rights to name these guns after their real life counterparts, they've instead gone now with made up names. Your starting handgun, which is still pretty good at taking out most enemies, is obviously based off a Glock, but in the game it's called the Black Panther. It's alright I guess, but it'll quickly get replaced and forgotten, like my MySpace page. The 44 pistol, which is clearly based off a Desert Eagle, is named the Silver Talon. Get it? Eagle and Talon? This thing though is a goddamn hand cannon, and it has little trouble separating limbs from torsos. It also sounds like an artillery strike when it goes off. It's really one of the best weapons to show off the ghoul damage system too. Aim it at a specific body part and chances are it's just going to remove it entirely, and it never gets old. The shotgun which is based off a Spaz 12 is called the B42, and honestly, this thing is hands down one of the single best shotguns in any first person shooter, honestly of all time. The sound this baby makes is orgasmic, and it absolutely destroys whatever gets in its path. Not to mention Mullins reloads it so damn quickly, I can't even imagine how good this guy's third base game is. It's kind of hard to overstate just how fucking awesome this shotgun is, I mean it still really does hold up as one of the best of all time. And if you're not using this weapon as much as possible when you're playing this thing, well, you're playing the game wrong. The only downside is that it's not as good against armoured enemies, which is what you pretty much take on exclusively for the end of the campaign. But early on, this thing just tears the enemies a new asshole, and they won't even know what hit them. 
Moving on to automatic weapons, you've got a few, starting off with the submachine guns. And I gotta say that I'm just an absolute sucker for submachine guns in my video games. I don't know why that is, I think it's something about the high rate of fire and the damage output that just tickles me right on the ball sack. From the MP5 in Half-Life through to the MAC-10s in Max Payne, there's just something about a good SMG that always does it for me, and Soldier of Fortune has two of these. The first one is the Raptor, and it's really a bit of a workhorse weapon for most of the game up until you get the heavy machine gun later on, both of which use the same ammo. I love the way this thing feels when you shoot it, and the animation for all of the shell casings flying out just looks great as well. But the real shit Sunny Jim is the silenced SMG based off a of Mac 11. I don't think I can fully explain just how cool I thought this gun was the first time I picked it up. Ever since that scene in Pulp Fiction when Bruce Willis blows John Travolta away with one of these things, I'd always thought it was one of the coolest looking submachine guns of all time. And again in Escape from New York when Snake Plissken's walking around with it for half of the damn film, with a scope mounted onto the silencer, I've just always thought this gun looked boss. The only other time I think I've seen this weapon in a video game before this was Blood 2 and Shogo Mobile Armor Division back in 1999. But this one in Soldier of Fortune is modelled way better and it sounds awesome. Not to mention it just feels so satisfying spraying down two or three bad guys at once. Later on in the game you'll come up against the Yakuza and these guys are very fond of this weapon too, so you'll be putting it to good use. I mean it probably should have been an Uzi if we're talking about the Yakuza here, but look I'll take it all the same. I've never been a huge fan of sniper rifles in shooting games, only because it forces me to stand still to use them, which I find irritating with my horrible attention span. Soldier of Fortune has a sniper rifle too, but I kind of feel like it's just been put in there to fill the quota. About all it's good for here is that one cinematic where John's aiming at Saddam Hussein's head. Excuse me, Mr. Hussein. I need the general alive. Thing is though, once you get the heavy machine gun, all of these weapons pretty much become irrelevant. The reason for that is that the heavy machine gun is an absolute beast. It does some hefty damage, it fires quickly, and it's also accurate. It just kind of renders the other weapons obsolete which is really saying something considering it's being compared to a powerhouse like the Silver Talon and the Shotgun. Like everything else John gets his hands on, it looks and it sounds awesome, so there's not really anything to complain about. The last few weapons are kind of like the token novelty weapons more than anything else. You've got a flamethrower which functions as you'd expect, leaving enemies writhing in pain as they're roasted alive. You've got a rocket launcher which reminds me a lot of the one that Arnie uses at the end of Commando. And there's even a highly armoured enemy type that you come up against using one of these things too. There's the slug thrower which is the nickname your mum gave me, which is like a fast firing explosive rifle but it doesn't show up until the last mission in the game. So you don't even get that much of a chance to use it. And then the final one is the microwave gun, which is part lightning gun, part rail gun. It's easily the most powerful weapon in the entire game, and it kills enemies by cooking them from the inside out. Randomly too, it also seems to make enemies explode, like a certain microwave casserole. This might, I think, be one of the first games where you could also bind items to the keyboard, which is kind of crazy when you think about it that this didn't become the norm in shooters for at least another three or four years. I mean, in this you can bind buttons to quick throw grenades or C4 satchels, or pop a medkit and heal. Even three years after this when Half-Life 2 came out, you'd still have to change manually to a grenade to throw it. Here though, you can just bind it to the G button for instance, and it definitely helps in making a game like this easier to pick up and play. Weapons aside, I think a big part of what makes this game so much fun is that it has such a tightly crafted campaign where you spend almost the entire time with your finger on the left mouse button. Uh. The game starts off as you're taking out terrorists inside the New York City subway with the shotgun, trying to avoid all the innocent civilians, and then this ends with a chase down some active subway tunnels, avoiding passing carriages. After that, you're on a train, hunting down one of the first four nukes that's been stolen, in a train level that gives the Phantom Express from Blood a real run for its money. After that, you're in Kosovo, fighting guys with explosive tanks on their backs, which can be shot and blown up if you're accurate enough, looking for another nuke amongst the backdrop of a civil war. One of my favourite missions, though, is when you're going through a slaughterhouse in Sudan, with the obligatory conveyor belt hazard to watch out for too, another staple of older first-person shooters. And you'll return to New York City later on to take out some more skinheads, ending with a hostage situation inside a hotel. 
before then heading to Tokyo and fighting the Yakuza, some of whom are decked out in ninja outfits with silent submachine guns and katanas. It all ends in a boss fight against Decker in Germany for the final mission, in a castle that looks like something out of a Medal of Honor game, and in an area where he was even nice enough to leave out a bunch of ammo and armor for you, you know, in case you're running low. What a nice guy. <laughs> even on the so-called challenging difficulty setting, Soldier Fortune is still a pretty easy game. Health items are pretty limited, but armor pickups are abundant, and certain enemy types drop armor when they're killed. Again, it all just kind of taps into this concept of you playing as an action movie hero, able to shrug off damage like it's little more than just an irritation. Yeah, you're John Mullen's son, and you ain't got time to bleed. If you're just moving through the game at a steady pace, I'd say you can easily beat this thing in around five or so hours, probably even less when you know what you're doing. But this is a campaign with its foot firmly pressed down on the gas pedal the entire time. You're pretty much on a rampage constantly, save for a few brief moments when the action slows down. Like those few times when you're in the shop getting your next briefing, and at one point for all of two minutes, you go undercover in Iraq. Doesn't take long though before you start committing genocide in the streets again. I think a big part of why I enjoy playing this game, and why I always invariably end up coming back to it all the time, is because it is just such a quick and a fun game to blast through. Compared to Half-Life, for instance, where you've got to sit through that prologue in the tram ride, then move through the facility and cause that resonance cascade and all that nonsense. Soldier of Fortune starts off with you gunning down whacked out skinheads at point blank range with a shotgun. In fact, probably not more than a couple of minutes into the game and you'll have lost count of the amount of body parts you've amputated. It's why I think it's still so fun and so accessible in the current year too. I can understand if people playing Half-Life for the first time don't react positively to it, but I would be pretty damn surprised if someone didn't think Soldier of Fortune was still a blast. So finally, if you are going to check this game out, which I do recommend, you've got a few ways to go about it. The first couple are the console ports for the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2, both of which I don't recommend. I actually bought the PlayStation 2 version of the game a couple of years back just out of interest, and all I can say is that you're better off firing that thing into the goddamn sun. And if you had to experience the game this way for your first time, well, then my condolences. It used to be impossible to find a digital copy of this thing, but that's now been fixed ever since it was picked up and sold on goodoldgames.com. And that, I guess, works pretty well, but you have to kind of bugger around a bit to get widescreen working. Which means I think ultimately the best way to play the game is the downloadable Community Edition, which runs flawlessly on modern hardware and even comes with a bunch of other graphical improvements added in as well. Not to mention, most importantly, you can now change your FOV. You might need to cap your frame rate to 60 though when you're playing it, otherwise there's a tendency for you to kind of slide all over the place when you take damage, as if you're skating on ice. Other than that though, I think this is the best way to play the game in the current year, until Night Dive Studios somehow picks up the rights to this and remasters it, which I hope is only a matter of when, not if. I think the only real main issue with the game is that it just really does lack variety in the gameplay department. You're really just moving from level to level, killing people over and over, and there's not all that much else to it. It can kind of feel mindless at times, and when you finally got that heavy machine gun, you almost kind of go into autopilot mode, just mowing down one bad guy after the other. But I do think it ends at the right time, before it starts to feel boring and repetitive. It seems to know the best time to wrap things up, which it does. But the game ends here. Opinions on the second game can be pretty divided, and even personally, I've gone from absolutely loathing that game, to approaching it from a different angle, and in some ways, coming to really enjoy it. Soldier of Fortune 1 though, there's no illusions here. This is a violent, fun, fast-paced shooter that doesn't beat around the bush, and it knows exactly what it is. And if I've achieved what I've set out to do from this video, which is just to make more people aware of it and go and pick it up, well, then I can consider that mission accomplished.